about liquid cooling, it's a hot topic all around the world. And I'll try to make in this few minutes uh, the most of uh, what can I show you the difference between uh, regular data center with air cooling system. Uh, it was shown very well by the last presenters. And the difference between uh, project with air cooling and liquid cooling system. And main difference, by the way. But first of all, I want to give you some context. This is the, an Uptime Institute uh, survey uh, asking about liquid cooling. And if you can see here, uh, of all the, the persons who were question about the LC, direct liquid on chip, 22% uses, currently uses the LC, and 61 do not use, but would consider. If you see and do the maths, 83% think about liquid cooling. So it's a pretty huge number. And if you see what types of liquid cooling they are using, most of the data centers are using DLC, direct liquid on chip. They can use immersion cooling and other solutions, but those two are the main uh, solutions for liquid cooling, uh, immersion cooling and DLC. And DLC is the most used uh, by now, I don't know, tomorrow. And this is uh, one interesting thing. The uptime question, the persons, uh, what are the threshold to implement liquid cooling based on IT rack power? And most of the persons says that will be around 20 to 29 percent, uh, 20 to 29 kilowatts per rack. But the question, if you, if you do the maths, uh, you can cool a rack with air cooling systems up to 55 six barrel six, 60 kilowatts. But why people think that can, they can they need to go liquid cooling beyond 30 kilowatts? The thing is, this question, in my opinion, is wrong. It's not the, uh, the rack density that drives liquid cooling. In fact, what drives liquid cooling is the thermal design power, we call TDP, is how much power a chip will give to the air or to the uh, to the environment when they are working. So if you see this graph on AMD, now we are in 25, uh, 2024, GPU TDPs grew up to 700 watts. Imagine uh, this tiny chip producing 700 watts. So the problem is not the heat, but how much heat are produced in that small area. And if you see this graph on ASHRAE, you see chips, uh, CPU or GPU or whatever you want, around 350 needs to go to liquid cooling. Doesn't, doesn't really matter uh, the rack density, but the chip density. If you look at this graph, this is a typical chip design. So you have here the dye, it means the nucleus, where the, all the heat are produced. And you have here the, the heat sink. This is a ordinary graphic uh, card from a PC. And if you see these heat sinks that I use, normally use, and compare to this heat sink, it's not heat sink, it's a heat pump, but anyway, look at the size of this to cool and dye of 400 uh, millimeter, square millimeters of area. Compare the air of the chip and the air of the heat sink. That is the main problem. We cannot go any further with heat sinks. Heat sinks will be huge. It will consume 50% of the area of the volume of the data center. So it's impossible. It's not impossible, but it's pretty hard to cool a chip of 500 kilowatts, 700 kilowatts with an air cooling system. That's what we would need a heat sink huge for one, for example, one new server. We need a heat sink for, uh, I don't know, 30 uh, U's of size. So we have one server and all the rack will be a heat sink. So it, it's become hard to air cool this. This is the real driver of liquid cooling. 
Uh, I, we have data centers here in Brazil, for example, that uses uh, racks up to 50 kilowatts air cooling by hot walls and uh, hot, uh, hot iron coal, uh, hot, uh, in the hot iron uh, closed. 50 kilowatts with air cooling, no liquid cooling. So the, here is the problem. So maybe you have a rack of, I don't know, five kilowatts, but the chips are so dense, so dense that you will not be able to do an air cooling with a one, 500, uh, five kilowatts uh, rack. So keep in mind, the real driver of liquid cooling is chip density, not rack density. This is the real driver. So to present to you, if you are new to liquid cooling, I would like you to present, uh, this is a pretty typical design of a liquid cooling data center. You have here uh, refrigeration equipment. We also know as chillers, dry coolers or whatever. In this case, of course, it's a chiller and they have uh, heat tower uh, uh, rejection, uh, heat reject by a cooling tower here. And we have this first water loop that we already know, we are already familiar. We call condenser water system. Then you have another loop here. We used to call this chilled water loop that technically we call facility water system, FWS. And in a regular data center, what happened is this loop reaches a crack, for example, uh, absorbs heat from the coil, then go back to the chiller. If you imagine this as a crack, this is a regular data center that we already know. But now this loop reaches uh, one equipment that we call CDU, coolant distribution unit, is a, a cousin of power distribution unit. We are already familiar. Now we have coolant distribution units too in the data center. And basically this is a heat exchanger with pumps, etc. cetera, you'll see more in details. But basically, we have a heat exchanger here, and we have this brand new loop here. We call the TCS, Technology Cooling System, that goes inside your data center, inside your data hall, near to the IT equipment. This is the new of liquid cooling. And sometimes you have another loop inside the rack that you call DACS, Data Column Equipment Cooling System, Usually it concerns to the IT uh, uh, team, right? So now talking about infrastructure engineers, we are going here. Li liquid cooling is not new. Now IBM has his mainframes, I don't know, Zeta 13, liquid cooling. And they already have a CDU, is not new too, but usually, 20 years ago, all this part of the system was concerned for IT team, including CU. For us, from infrastructure, we just have to uh, give uh, chilled water. And it doesn't matter what the IT equipment does with this chilled water inside the, the equipment. Now the CDU and the TCS concerns to the engineering side. So that's why it's new for us, but it's not that new, right? So this is the very typical. Oh, the, uh, the pipe work can be down on a raised floor, can be uh, on the air, up the racks to the design changes. But the main idea is to have another loop of liquid, can be water, can be an dielectric fluid, can be a water mixed with uh, propylene glycol or whatever. It can be a lot of things here inside these pipes that cools directly the rack. This is a typical CDU. CDUs can be classified by mainly by two things, the approach and what type of heat rejection they have. For example, this is the most used CDU. They have a liquid to liquid heat exchanger. It means they will exchange heat between two fluids they are taking the water from FWS and exchanging heat, not mixing, just exchanging heating and energy uh, with the TCS. And you have the TCS loop here. This is the mostly used CDU right now. You can have CDU liquid to air. You have a CDU, 
you have the TCS loop between the IT equipment and the CDU, and this CDU rejects the heat to the air for the data center. So it will be air cooled. The CDU will be air cooled. It's to solve the problem of the size of the heat sink. If you think about the CDU, huge CDU, they have a huge heat sink, huge area of heat exchanging. So they solve the problem of the concentrated heat on a chip, right? But this is the main use that I've seen, uh, at least in America, United States and Latin America, they are using liquid to liquid uh, heat exchanger. Liquid to, liquid to air, they use most to retrofit data centers. They have a legacy data center. They need to go to liquid cooling if one or two racks, and they use a CDU liquid to air to cool those racks. But anyway, the structure is basically a heat exchanger, pumps, redundant pumps, of course, filters, controls, and basically is that, of course, you have CDUs with a lot of controls, a lot of uh, integration with BNS, et cetera, et cetera. But mechanically talking, it's basically this, as simple as that. As I said to you, CDUs uh, can be compared by the type of heat rejection. We already talked about this. And we can talk about approach temperature. What is the approach temperature? Is the difference the temperature between the FWS and the TCS. You can say that is the inefficiency that we are adding to the system by adding a heat exchanger. For example, if you have a supply water, chiller water temperature at I don't know, 15, and you have an approach temperature of five, your TCS supply will be at 20, 15 plus five. This is the approach. And you can compare CDUs on different vendors by the approach and the type of heat rejection. It has a lot of things too. You can control, uh, you can compare controls, et cetera, leak detection, blah, blah, blah. But the main things are approach. It depends better. Uh, they depends on the size of the heat exchanger and the type of heat rejection. And this is the typical uh, design of liquid cooling systems with CDUs. The CDUs can be on the rows and can be on a gallery on the perimeter of the data hall. This is much common. Uh, I've saw. 90% of the projects are solved this way because it's easy. For example, you already have your data center with press. If your FWS passing by, you can take a CRA out and put a CDU, for example. It's easy to do this. And you keep the maintenance guys outside of the data hall. This is important for the IT uh, teams. Keep the, the mechanical, uh, technicals, and stuff as far as they can get from IT equipment on production, right? So this is a uh, pretty standard solution for CDUs nowadays. And one question that comes in mind is, do they need, we need a CDU? If we are adding a heat exchanger, we are adding Thank you.